Home is dubbed the Candlestick, Australia's most inaccessible pinnacle. Soaring 400 feet up out of an angry sea on Tasmania's southeastern tip, flanked by vertical cliffs, the Candlestick is guarded by nature. And as the climb is discovered, she doesn't let a guard down. What actually is going to make it tough is the fact that we don't know what the pictures are like really except by, by sight. Uh, it's a little bit far away to see properly. If it rains or if it blows, um, obviously it's going to be much more difficult. Well, it's looking at the, looking at the candlestick from here. What type of rock is that? It's, I should think it's dolerite. And what's that like to find one? It depends where it is really. Um, this sort of stuff is uh, probably affected by salt action from the sea. And it tends, from what I've seen in other parts of Tasmania, to be uh, a bit scaly in parts, have a sort of crust on it that uh, isn't all that trustworthy. Well, how, how's that going to affect your climb tomorrow? Well, it means that bits could break off when you're standing on them or pulling up on them, or you've got to test everything to see that it's all right before you use it. There are two things about climbing. One's your abilities and one's the psychological barriers you've got to overcome within yourself. And uh, that first pitch is very, has got, really got me psyched up. Oh, the candlesticks, the candlesticks beautiful. Here you've got this rock, the same proportions as a candlestick, coming straight up out of the water, 400 foot high. You know, that looks very pleasing. It looks very bold, and it needs bold climbing to be able to do it. The channel between the mainland and the island has to be bridged. There's only one way to get a rope over, and that's to wait for the swell to subside and swim. Mendel Tillamant tied the rope on and went for the most terrifying swim of his life.
up Jeez like that and then God. go out the way. See yeah. here. He's exhausted, battered, and despite the protection of the life jacket, all the skin's been ripped from his chest. The rope he was trying to attach to the other side of the channel has become a lifeline, and the other climbers frantically pulled Mendel out of the boiling surf before the waves built up again. The channel remains unbridged, but Mendel's okay. Round one to the candlestick. Three climbers will try and scale a candlestick's northern face, a climb that's been described as impossible. Glenn Kowalik, who's 24, is a personnel officer for Telecom. A climber for eight years, Glenn watched his best friend die in an avalanche while climbing in New Zealand. He's also climbed in the Swiss Alps and Nepal. Mendel Tillema, 28, an electronics engineer. He spent most of his climbing career in Tasmania, but the lure to scale the fabled Welsh cliffs got too strong a year back, and he climbed in England. Dr. Leswood, 31, a geography lecturer at the Tasmanian University, the most experienced of the trio. Les has climbed in Britain, the French Alps, the Italian Dolomites, East Africa, and in Canada. Climbing equipment is pretty basic, but now climbers believe the fewer mechanical aids, the better. But some aids are essential, like the piton. They've got to go into cracks. Uh, you've got to have the right size crack. You get very expert after a while at telling what's a soundly placed one and what's not. Usually if you hit them and you hit middle C, they're quite, they're quite good. If you um, hit them and they've got a hollow sound, you, they usually aren't. Well, what happens if you right. haven't got any cracks in the rock wall? Um, you well, probably wouldn't be there in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, generally, we prefer not to use pittons if we can help it. But with um, cracks of different sizes, you can usually manage to find a, one of these things. These are called eccentrics. Um, they come in a whole range of shapes and sizes. You can see all these things here. Um, the general idea is that you push one of these into a crack. You've got a sling attached to it with a carabiner on the other end. Um, now, if that's <coughs> securely placed in a crack, it means that we can pass a rope through there and the leader on the top end, the second on the bottom end, and you only fall twice the distance that you are above the crab. A carabiner is, as you can see, is a, it's a metal snap link. Comes in also in various shapes and sizes, but generally in the, in the oval to, to that size. Uh, it's got a gate which opens uh, for ease of putting the rope in. You don't pass the rope actually through it like that. You actually open the gate and just slip it in like that. These are your connecting link, a strong link between uh, your anchor point and your rope. Whilst you're climbing, what you're doing all the time is looking for places to put protection. That, at least I am anyway. And you you sort of assess every crack in terms of what size chop will go into it or, you know, uh, in that sort of way. Uh, where there's no obvious holes and there's only cracks, you've got to try and uh, use hand jams and foot jams. You've got to jam your foot in the crack and then twist it to give you that hole. For instance, you can get a fist jam like this. You've got to get your hand in somehow and then clench it and give it a twist to jam it in the crack. Well, it looks as if they've got the rope ready and so you might as well head off and have a go at it. Right. All right. All right. See See ya. Dwarfed by the towering cliffs, Mendel takes on the first assault alone. With a tiny rubber raft strapped to his back, he's got to clamber down the sheer 200-foot mainland cliff, launch the raft, and paddle through the waves to the foot of the candlestick. Nobody would take up climbing after this bloody performance. <laughs> and this is just what climbing is not about. So far, so good. The waves were calm for the crossing, but he's got to scale the sheer wall, made slimy by sea spray. 
The only help he's got is a narrow vertical crack and his own perseverance. He's established a start, but he needs more equipment. Les and Glenn send the pack down Mendel's safety line. He's got more equipment, but the pack's bulky, hindering his climb. And though the rock here is dry, it's treacherous. Mama mia! He's okay, but the fall could have meant tragedy. As it is, Mendel's winded and his pride's hurt because he's lost 30 precious feet and he's got to start the assault all over again. Oh, Mendel's doing a bloody good job. What was that? Mendel's doing a bloody good job. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Climbing's a dangerous sport because of its uncertainty. But dedicated climbers just learn to live with it. Always subjective danger. No matter how careful a climber you are, you might get a rock fall on your shoulder and, you know, break a shoulder blade or something like that. You, you just can't imagine the possible... The, it is dangerous. You can't must imagine the possible things that can happen, but you've got to be prepared to overcome these if they do. But despite the danger, or maybe because of it, they keep coming back to challenge nature at its hardest. You come to the bottom of the cliff, you sort of see a good line. You think, that's lovely, you know, that's, that'd be beautiful to climb. It looks nice, looks clean. And you start climbing, and you get these various problems on the way. And bit by bit, you overcome these problems. And especially if it's a new route where you're hunting around to try and find uh, the route to, you know, create a good way to go up, and you eventually overcome all these problems. You get to the top, and it's quite exhilarating. But there's no exhilaration now, just hard muscle tearing work, swinging round the pinnacle to reach the first ledge, and safety. Now it's time for that exhilaration. The candlestick isn't giving in easily. The first 40 feet took about three hours, and nightfall cut short the main assault. Around our campfire, plans are made and then remade for tomorrow's attempt. Mendel retraced his steps after setting the safety line, but Les is worried about the next pitch, the one he's got to lead. While Mendel has bandaged his bruised hands and relaxes, his success has heartened everyone. But Glenn, like Les, spent the day watching. Tomorrow we'll see if his experience and tenacity can match the candlestick. The next day is cold and misty, and at first light, Mendel uses the safety line as a flying fox to regain last night's position on the first ledge. He's 40 feet up, and unless the precarious rock anchor on the candlestick holds, he's history. Keep going. The anchor holds and Mendel makes the ledge, followed over by Glenn and Les. And while Mendel and Glenn wait on the first ledge, Les moves out on the second pitch, a narrow chimney in the rock leaning slightly away from the vertical. He's hampered by the surface. Handholds dislodge the weather-beaten rock and each foothold has to be tested and tested again. If the rock gives, Les has got a long way to fall. Um, just to the, the, the groove just to the right of there would be less than a body width. And how the hell can you stay on when in a position like that? There's just no way at all. 
short of hanging on knots everywhere. Tension. Tension brought on by exertion and anxiety. Why make the effort? It's, it's just the, the sheer physical pleasure of moving over rock. I'm not worried about being, well, I suppose I am in a remote sort of way, but uh, might, might sound a bit trite, but I don't think I'm going to injure myself climbing. I'm too careful. Theoretically, anyway, the worst part's over. They're halfway up, time for a snack. The next pitch the three face is crumbly and dangerous, but it takes them to Thank Christ Ledge, 100 feet below the summit. Thank Christ got its name from a Tasmanian climber, Reg Williams, who got to the ledge on a giant flying fox, rigged between the mainland and the island. After his perilous journey, and he set foot in the ledge, his first words gave Thank Christ Ledge its name.
The sun's out now, and the rock's starting to warm up, which means ideal conditions. It's a bit of a challenge in itself, uh, me, me against the rock sort of thing. Um, it's nothing, nothing more exciting, I think, than, than moving up a steep bit of warm, sunlit rock, uh, perhaps with a bit of sea below you, or just a, a nice steep drop below you. The final pitch, and Les leads up from Thank Christ Ledge. Stretching for a hand jam, Les smashes his hand in the crack. He won't be able to lead the final pitch, which is much tougher than anyone predicted. So it's up to Mendel, who took on the tough first pitch to finish the climb. All right, run. A hand jam. <sighs> Left my peg hammer down below, didn't I? Get steep here for a little bit, Glenn.
Yeah, we're right now. Up you go. They're almost there. The north face has almost been beaten. And as Les and Mendel wait, Glenn finally gets round the buttress, which has given the three so much trouble. The final obstacle's been overcome. Candlestick. They've made it. The candlestick's been beaten. Tired and bruised, with muscles feeling like jelly, they're finally on top, with a breathtaking view of the route they've just taken. This is the exhilaration that rock climbing's all about. A combination of teamwork and individual effort, sudden danger and spectacular natural beauty. It's been a hell of an undertaking, but they've done it. They've conquered Australia's most inaccessible pinnacle, the candlestick. It's all over. Looking a bit tired there, but uh, some was getting to me a bit. Pretty hot on that rock. It's quite a climb, that. The climbing's finished. Uh, some of the climbing in the top half is quite good climbing, but I, I was thankful to get right to the top and to know that the next thing was getting down. Well, I'm on the top. Thank goodness, you know, let's get off. And that's all I felt. There's one thing about the candles, uh, the climb we did, I think all of us have climbed climbs to a far higher standard. But um, it's the whole aspect of the position of that uh, C stack and access off on and off it, and the looseness of the rock which make it a very serious undertaking. Sports Night, I'd just like to say thanks to the Forestry Commission of Tasmania, which controls this area, and the blokes that work for it are really good at getting cars out of bogs, the Climbers Club of Tasmania, and especially its secretary, Cole Hocking, and the ABC Sporting Supervisor in Tasmania, Mr Don Kloss, who makes the best cup of tea this side of the mainland. And now...